Let's talk about information disclosure or info leak vulnerabilities. What are they? Well, they're the induced disclosure of information that is meant to remain confidential. And of course, in the context of this class, they are induced through ACID. But of course, that doesn't always have to be the case. So why do they matter? Well, they can be used to defeat exploit mitigations that depend on randomization, which typically depends on some sort of randomized secret. So address-based layout randomization, for instance, depends on the attacker not knowing the layout of memory, and stack canaries are just random values stuck onto the stack. So if an attacker can bypass these exploit mitigations, then they can perhaps achieve full exploit chains and achieve their final goals. Additionally, info leaks can matter not for the purposes of the typical sort of memory corruption type vulnerabilities that we've been focusing on in these classes, but just disclosing secrets in general can be bad because if things like cryptographic keys, documents that are stored in memory, passwords, keystrokes, if any of those kind of things get leaked out of memory, then the defender is potentially having a bad day, right? You don't want your passwords to be leaked out of memory. Once again, me US guy, no like lot word chunk. So instead of information disclosure, we're gonna go with the much more common info leaks term. Now returning again to why they matter, let's talk about the exploit enabler. So we had seen in a past example, so this one right here, CV 2020-17087, covered that in vulnerabilities 1001, and we saw this diagram from a Google Project Zero blog post that talked about how the attacker achieved their goals via exploit chains. And so they would infect a website, people would go to the website, they would break into the browser, whether Safari or Google Chrome, and then depending on whether or not they land on, for instance, iOS versus Windows, they would have different privilege escalation vulnerabilities. In the case of iOS, they said before they could privilege escalate, they had to use an info leak to defeat the address-based layout randomization. And indeed, there were other blog posts by Google Project Zero that looked at all sorts of different exploit chains for iOS across time, how long they lasted, and which operating systems and phones they affected. And for every single one of these exploit chains, it actually required an information disclosure as well. But it's not just iOS, it's any operating system. An info leak may be an integral portion of an exploit chain to achieve the final goals of privilege escalation. So that's why info leaks matter for exploit mitigation bypass. Now let's return again to the idea of info leaks just allowing to steal contents from memory. So there's a very famous vulnerability named Heartbleed, and it had this particular logo and this particular website. And this was a bug in the handling of heartbeat packets in OpenSSL library. And this particular bug allowed for remote disclosure over the internet of things like private keys from a server that's running open in SSL. So it could be a VPN server, could be a web server, but if it was using this open SSL library, essentially this vulnerability would allow an attacker to reach out and steal memory from that machine. So that was super bad for an attacker to be able to go out and steal a private key from, for instance, web server, because then they could impersonate that website and browser lock icons would all show that everything was secure. I will also point out that this Heartbleed vulnerability started the trend of giving logos and dedicated websites to vulnerabilities. And things had been named before this, but they you know, released this nice little logo and it really took off. And in this particular case, I think it was appropriate because this was a very, very bad bug. But then a bunch of other people jumped on this bandwagon and they just wanted their own bug and website because they saw how much press attention this had gotten. And so not everything with a logo and a website is necessarily an important bug. Sometimes it's just, oh, VC funded startups that are trying to get attention. Well, info leaks are an important part of a perfectly balanced breakfast. Perfectly balanced, as all things should be. So info leaks, along with acid pointers and stack or heap overflows and integer underflows, sign sizes, well, Thanos allows you to just write what where. And the analogy here is that in this perfectly balanced breakfast, your code is toast. And so if you happen to notice that all of these look like vulnerability 1001 types of problems, that's because I made these slides last year and we just pushed info leaks back to 1002. So info leak vulnerabilities, where do they come from? What do they want from us? Who do they think they are? That's your Weird Al deep cut for the day. Slime Creatures from Outer Space, 1995. Dare to be stupid album.
So there's different types of info leaks we can consider, microarchitectural, intrinsic, and manufactured. Now, microarchitectural vulnerabilities are out of scope for this class. Uh, just like with race conditions, we put some of them out of scope because the recommendations wouldn't really follow along or be related to anything else in the class. Similarly, microarchitectural vulnerabilities, they're absolutely important info leak vulnerabilities, but the guidance for how to mitigate them is going to be completely and wildly different uh, depending on the particular architecture, depending on the particular vulnerability. So basically the guidance for these are not going to align with any of the other guidance in this class. So out of scope for now, maybe in a future class. But these so-called microarchitectural side channel attacks exploit features of the microarchitecture, the underlying architecture of how CPUs work. So in the case of these famous things, Spectre and Meltdown, there were particular ways that the Intel CPU handled things like speculative execution for Spectre. And so you had particular branches and the CPU sees assembly coming along and it says, oh, I think that I'm going to take this branch. So let me go ahead and execute a few of those assembly instructions uh, before I actually get there and like just put them in the pipeline and get them going. But that allowed ultimately for an attacker to leak information uh, based on the things going down paths, based on side effects or side channel uh, analysis of things going down paths that were never actually properly executed. So anyways, microarchitectural attacks jumped on the named logo bandwagon big time. And yes, these were generally important, but they're sort of uh, diminishing importance and diminishing relevance things, but still trying to stay on that bandwagon and get attention. Now, intrinsic info leak vulnerabilities are things that actually just exist fundamentally in the code. And so this is more like the kind of stuff that we've seen elsewhere in the class. So for instance, you can have stack or heap not overflow, but overread. And so these will be caused by the same root causes as linear heap overflows and, and stack overflows. But instead of writes, they're going to involve reads. So for instance, if we had a mem copy and kernel space and user space, and it's going to mem copy from kernel space out to user space, let's say that the kernel heap has some stuff that has all been initialized on the heap. And then there's a mem copy, but there's an attacker controlled length. And although it only wanted to pass back four times eight bytes, instead 64 bytes are going to be passed back. And if the source was right here and the dest is right here in user space, then this will lead to an over copy. And so this could potentially have information that's being disclosed that is advantageous to the attacker. For instance, kernel function pointers, which on some operating systems, if you know the data that's going to be copied and you get a function pointer back, you may be able to just automatically calculate the displacement that the kernel has been uh, located in memory, where it's been, you know, randomized. And once you have that displacement, then you will know where all sorts of other kernel functions can be found, which you might use for things like return oriented programming against the kernel. All right, other things like out of bound reads instead of out of bound writes. Well, when we were dealing with acid offsets and indices being used for out of bound writes, you could have the exact same thing occurring for a read. And not every in out of bound read is necessarily going to be an info leak. You can absolutely have something go out of bounds but not feed the data back to an attacker, so it wouldn't actually be leaking anything. But for this class, we're going to specifically be looking for situations where it will be an info leak. So let's imagine that we had an index of five that is attacker controlled, and then this in array is pointing in kernel space in the heap, and we'll say that the out is gonna point out to user space. This index five is actually indexing past the end of that particular array, and so subsequently, the write from in to out will grab some information and it'll be stuck into user space. And I know I'm showing here that this is uninitialized data past the bounds of the array. It doesn't necessarily have to be uninitialized data. It could be initialized data from some other area of memory. But uh, the important thing is just, you know, if there's useful information like known function pointers, the attacker can use that to de-randomize and bypass exploit mitigations. Then there's OODA, un uninitialized data access vulnerabilities. So again, when you have copies across these boundaries, potentially, you know, we're going to just keep going with the address-based layout randomization uh, leakage. So let's say that some data was initialized on the heap, and then it was freed on the heap, and then we had a partial initialization, which subsequently meant that there would be some leftover data left in between these fields of the struct. 
then if this data was copied from kernel space to user space, that uninitialized area right there is what actually would be readable in user space and subsequently disclose some information. And once again, things like function pointers could be useful for de-randomization. All right, so these sort of info leaks, intrinsic info leaks can happen for all sorts of other reasons. Just wanted to show some examples of how they could occur with the bug types that we've already learned about. You'll see more of that in the real example. Then of course we have manufactured info leaks. And if you've been watching all of the content rather than just a subset, you will have already seen manufactured info leaks in the context of some particular exploit explanation. In vulnerabilities 1001, there was the SMB ghost vulnerability where they created an info leak. And in 1002, there was this vulnerability 2021-1732 and its variant vulnerability where the attacker could leak information after they had successfully corrupted memory and caused a type confusion. So, you know, if we think about overflows and out-of-bound writes, you can imagine that the attacker will use the write primitive, whatever it is, whether it's stack, heap, buffer overflow, whether it's out-of-bound write, if they can overwrite a data pointer, creating an acid pointer, then if they execute some existing legitimate code that reads from that pointer, well, they can point it anywhere they want, and so they can leak information from anywhere they want. In the context of type confusions, you could have situations where different types have different sizes. And so if you imagine that, you know, type A was 30 bytes and type B is 256 bytes, and maybe there is some sort of type copying function or constructor that's being used based on a particular type. If something is confused into thinking A is a B, it may copy 256 bytes from A instead of 30. So finding manufactured info leaks is not the goal of this class, finding intrinsic ones is, because at the end of the day, there's really nothing to do about the manufactured info leaks other than fix the underlying vulnerability that caused them. So if they're using a heap overflow to create a acid pointer, you need to fix the heap overflow. There's nothing specifically to fix about the info leak other than the underlying root cause. And with that, let's go look at how some of the exact same problems that you've seen throughout this class and the previous class can ultimately lead to information disclosure instead of just typical arbitrary memory writes or code execution.